All right, and we're back with another episode of Live with Dave. It's been about a month and a half since we did the last one, Dave. I decided to uh, do this one in three chunks. It's going to be, it's kind of like a Scrooge uh, or a Charles Dickens thing. We're going to have a little bit of past, a little bit of present, and a little bit of future. So and how this is going to work. So you and I were talking off camera before we started today because I was telling you I had to take an exam today and it took a lot of time. And I thought to myself, boy, I haven't had to apply myself in a really long time. And I've always wondered this question. So we're going to start today with something of your past. What I want to start with in your past is I have two initial questions. I understand you went to school for all the medical stuff. What put you on? Look, okay, when someone wants to be a doctor, what was the process like? I, I just want to know for you. Hey, I, I was in 10th grade. What made you want to do it? What was the process like? What did you go to school for initially? What was the transition? And was it as hard as people think to be a doctor? Yeah. Um- you know, my, I think my mom always wanted me to, you know, I'm, I have the typical Jewish mother who wanted me to be the doctor type of thing. But I was always drawn towards biology. In school, I was really good at it. I always loved animals. I probably should have been a veterinarian, but I, you know, I, I, I liked the whole understanding how the body works. So that, it was something I natu- naturally gravitated towards. So it wasn't like I was pushed by my parents, but it, it was something that, you know, my parents wanted me to be the best that I could be type of thing. So... I went to college. When, my mother had passed away when I was 14, so she wasn't really in the picture, but I had always gravitated towards science, and I said, you know what? Um, one of the schools I had applied to was, the, was Franklin and Marshall College, which was a small liberal arts college, which appealed to me because I, I learn in, 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 in environments that are very small. I don't like huge lecture halls and that stuff. And they had a pre-med program like that was there, and, and I also was running track at the time, and the coach was interested in me. So I kind of worked this whole thing out where I kind of, got money from them. I got to go to this real fancy liberal arts college in a secluded area, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is not that big of an area, and uh, which would be more conducive to me working, obviously. And I was in the pre-med program. So they basically, you have a special guidance counselor that, that advises you which courses you need to take. So, you know, obviously I was a biology major on top of that, which I didn't have to be, but I just liked biology. And then I had to take like chemistry, inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry, uh, physics, uh, there's calculus, you know, two semesters. There's all these requirements for pre-med, whether you're a biology major or not. So, like, you could be a, a political science major and take the pre-med requirements, but there's a lot of – and I had to take biology. Too. I had to take two years of that, too, or something like that. So I did all that. Then, you know, in my third year, you start applying to med schools, and which is very difficult. You know, there's, there's thousands of people who apply, and very few people get into American medical schools because there's not that many slots. Now, I don't know what it is today. Today, I hear more women are going than men, but because men don't want to <laughs> suffer as much, I guess. So I applied to, like, maybe about eight schools. And then what happens is the next step is if you get an interview from the school, that's a good sign. That means they want to see you. So I went on a few interviews. I went to Tulane, uh, an interview there. I did one at New York Medical College where I eventually went. I got one in also in uh, uh, Downstate, which was in Brooklyn, which would have been the best financial decision because that was the cheapest one because it was state subsidized. Um, I didn't, I didn't, and I went to one, oh, Cornell. I actually had got in, my, my uncle worked there. He got me an interview. You'd think he would have been able to get me into the medical school, but he got me the interview at least. So I went there. So I did four interviews out of eight, which is good. And then I got into one school, which is all you, you know, I'm glad I only got into one because I would have had a chosen between two. I got into the New York Medical College up in Westchester. And what people don't realize is that any medical school in the United States is is great. I mean, most, a lot of people have to go out of state or if they don't get into medical school, what they'll do is they'll go to osteopathy, you know, um, DO school, become a doctor of osteopathy, you know school which they're very well educated those schools but you know they the medical society kind of like looks down upon that hey you couldn't get into medical school that kind of thing i actually probably would have been a better osteopath believe it or not than a physician because i they do more holistic medicine they do chiropractic manipulations it seems actually more interesting to me but i you know i was an elitist at that point i got to get into an american medical school so i got into that one school which was great because i got in i think it was like my the end of my junior year or something like that, or the beginning of my senior year, I found out once I knew I was in med school, I stopped working basically, you know. I was, it's like your senior year of high school. You don't have to, you know, quite, it doesn't matter anymore in pretty much anything you do. And then obviously I went to medical school. And then medical school, at least when I went, was broken down to the first two years was classroom stuff. Basically, you take a, a part, one of your medical boards after the second year, 
to see if you actually learned anything in, <laughs> in, your, in all the stuff you did. And I had to do all the labs, the gross anatomy labs, and dissecting the cadaver, human cadaver, and all that. And I liked that. That was all like classroom stuff. And then after that, then you start doing your rotations in the hospital, which I hated. I absolutely hated it. Because then I realized that all this knowledge I had was just being used to write prescriptions and, and treat you know, sickness. It wasn't really being used for preventative type medicine. And, and I really didn't really, and that kind of turned me off to the whole process. But um, how difficult was it? Um, they tell you this, and this is pretty accurate. The first week of medical school was everything you learned in college. Okay, that was, so if you didn't really pay attention in college, you were screwed because you're going to be way behind. Now the advantage, you know, everyone always told you, oh, don't be a biology major in college because, you know, it'll be more diversified if you're like a political science guy or like a, who knows what else, drama. Let me tell you something. I'm glad I was a biology ma uh, major because I had a very, very good biology background going into medical school, which helped me with medical school tremendously. Uh, and, you know, the truth is that I didn't find medical school that much more difficult than college. It was more intense, and you had to memorize a lot more stuff, which I really hate memorization, but, you know, I was young then. I could memorize stuff. Um, but a lot of people found it very difficult, and there were people that dropped out left and right. You know, I didn't drop out because I couldn't do the work. I dropped out because I, I didn't like the hospital stuff, you know. So for me, I didn't find it that difficult, but it was intense. The, the, the exams were like you know, long exams, uh, it was multiple choice, but there was like, it was never A, B, C, or D. It was A and B, or C and D, A, B, C, D, none of the above, all of the above. They were difficult exams. You had to know the material a lot. But I, but I liked it. You know, if you like what you're doing, it's not that hard. Um, I probably was like in the top, you know, the top half of my class. And there were guys that studied all day long, you know, and day and night, day and night, day and night, you know. But on certain, ex certain parts of medical school, like when I did pharmacology, I was, you know, number one. And there were other parts where I was in the middle of the pack because, you know, I did, maybe it was just something that wasn't as interesting to me. A lot, a lot of my, my motivation is, is whether I like what I'm doing or not. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I try to gravitate towards what I like because I know I'll spend a lot of time and effort on that. And then stuff I don't like, I tend to run away from, which is the hospital. And that's, reason, that's the reason... I kind of left the medical profession. I also, I, I also like the idea of being my own boss. And I don't know, I just, I don't have a problem taking instruction from people, but I just didn't like what I was being brainwashed into my head. I don't, in other words, I didn't really agree with, with a lot of the stuff that I was being taught. And when, when I have that being thrown at me, it's hard for me to assimilate that and make it my own, especially if I'm not like, well, you know, why are they writing prescriptions for this when they could be, you know, helping people change their diet and stuff like that? And so that, that kind of turned me off a little bit. But if you're not a science guy and you don't really like that information, being a doctor is not one of these professions you just go into, hey, I'm going to go into become a doctor because, it's, because I can make good money. It, it's, it's expensive, number one, the education. It's a very time-consuming field. It's all-encompassing. If you don't love it, you'll be a bad doctor. And... As you were going through the journey initially, were you planning on being like, uh, part of my ignorance here, like a general doctor? Or, you know, like, people, like when do people yeah. on this path decide pediatric or whatever they're doing? What, when's that all happen? Yeah, I mean, I was at that stage where I was, I was kind of having to decide what I wanted to kind of gear myself towards. Looking back on that, my interest really, I had a very good friend who, who was actually my one of my bodybuilding mentors. He was a really, he was very instrumental in, a lot of the stuff I did in bodybuilding. And he went to the same medical school. He was 20, 20 years earlier, and he was val valedictorian of his class. He was a genius, this guy, Dr. Mike. And Dr. Mike was a, was a, um, was a dermatologist. But he, op you know, he did surgeries and stuff like that. He was, and, and I really could have seen myself doing that because I, I liked the fact that there were no medical emergencies. Yeah, you put a lot of time in when you're in the office, but once you leave, you're not going to the emergency room for anything, you know what I mean? To, because you're, because you're, you're, you know, because the stent you put in the person's heart is closing up. So I like that aspect of it. However, another good friend of mine who is now my my endocrinologist, especially when I had my thyroid problem, him and I were the best friends growing up. He became an endocrinologist, and I and I kind of really liked hormones. Obviously, <laughs> I wonder why, you know, <laughs> you know, I liked the hormonal aspect. So endocrinology was a very difficult residency to get. However, same thing with dermatology. So. I probably would have gone into one of those two fields. I really had no desire to be a surgeon. I don't have a lot of patience, and I'm not like, 
I'm not like one of these guys who can sit there for 16 hours and, and dissect out tissues and stuff like that. I really didn't, that didn't interest me. I like diagnosing things. I probably would have been really good in an emergency room setting, but those guys burn out really quickly because it's, it's a lot, you know, especially if you're in, a, in, a, in like New York where you're having people come in with stab wounds and everything like that. It's a great high initially, but I, it's a very high rate of burnout. So I was, I was gearing, I would, would have probably done dermatology or endocrinology, I think. Well, I have a comment to add to it, but I'm going to first say that I agree that either one of those fields would have been good for you. And those yeah. of you out there who have ever worked with Dave, <laughs> he's the king of when you send the progress picture being like, you got to cut that off. We got to cut this off. Like, it would have been <laughs> the best to chop and shit off. You see people on the street, like, yeah, get that lump out. That yeah, ain't good. I, yeah I, no moles, no marks. Take it <laughs> off, you know, because you know what? <laughs> Before it becomes anything serious, you know. Yeah, you're always like your skin looks like shit. We're gonna put you on this. You're yeah. gonna do this. <laughs> so, you know what? Yes, and, and I always hated the fact when I went to the dermatologist when I was younger. They always told me, "Oh, you can eat what I had bad acne," and they're like, "You can eat whatever you want. It has nothing to do with how your skin breaks out." And I'm like, "Oh my god, these these people were imbeciles. They just would write write prescriptions for shit and, and give creams that did nothing." If you yep. know now, if I was an if I was a dermatologist, I'd be like giving diets out to people, you know, and stuff. Two follow-up questions for it. The first is, and I'm not trying to make it a, a political, I'm not heading anywhere with it. It's a general question because I didn't know where this conversation would go. You mentioned when you were in the training and you, in, in the classroom and things, you said, you know, there were times where they were saying, let's give a prescription for this is how we're going to approach it. And you're thinking, why don't we address the underlying issue? My question for you is, do you think it's as people oversimplify, it's all, it's all about the pharmaceutical companies we're trying to make money? Or do you think that it's just kind of indoctrinated in the medical world of this is what they really believe is the right thing to do? Yeah, they, they brainwash you in school for that. I, I, you know, when I was doing rotations in the hospital, especially, I can give you a good example for psychiatry because I did a, a prettiest, I did a um, rotation in Westchester County Medical Center, which is a tertiary care psychiatric ward. I mean, they get all, I saw the looniest of loonies. I mean, multi-personality disorders, everything that you've ever seen in any, every crazy movie on TV, that's what was in there. And that legitimately, you know, not crazy people. And they have a drug for everything. You know, if you come in and I, give them a drug, give them a drug, give them a drug, give them a drug. And I just, I hated that. You know, I hated that, you know, indigestion, give them a drug. Well, you know, maybe if you change the person's diet or, you know, you, know, you, you help alkalinize their body or, but they don't, you know, in, in medical school, they teach you only a certain way. So you're actually, people don't realize this, as a doctor, you're very limited on information you can give to people legally. So if, you, if I'm a doctor, let's say I have a degree and I give someone a diet, and God forbid they get a gallstone or a kidney stone, they'll sue me and say, well, he gave me that diet, that's what caused it. And now I'm liable and I could lose my license, my ability to practice, all because I am a doctor. If I'm not a doctor and I have no degrees and I give a diet out to someone and, and something, whatever, and they decide that they think that you know my advice was no good for them, hopefully that doesn't happen, but uh, never happened in all my career. But if it does, there's nothing that anyone could do because I'm not, I don't have any degrees. There's no certifications. It's, it's on them that they took advice from me. So maybe it was, it was a blessing. You know, it was meant to be that way because I like to give out a lot of information. I like to give alternative you know, medicines advice i like to give diet advice you know based on what the cutting edge is not what the textbook says and you can't do that if you have a degree in dietetics if you're a registered nurse if you're a doctor you are limited by what they have brainwashed into your head and what the board of whatever says that you can say and that's that's very limiting now if you like to work if you like being a nurse and working in a hospital and doing ivs and bloods and all that stuff then it's great if you like being a doctor and, and playing by the book, then that's great. But if you, if you like to think outside the box, it's very hard to do that in, in the medical profession. Final question on the medical front. Um, when you decided, you know what, this isn't for me, was it something where you kind of knew six months or a year earlier? Like, what was it? I'm oversimplifying saying, was yeah. it hard? But did you know, did it come out of nowhere? Or was it kind of creeping up in the back of your mind over time? You know, the first two years, I really loved the medical school. Like I said, it was all class. It was intense classroom stuff. It was, you know, all in common. But I didn't have a job. I, my, I went to the gym and tanned in a tanning bed, and I went to school. That was it. I didn't have any other responsibilities. So in, in that sense, it was not, it was fine. But once I had to go to the hospital and start working in there. So the way it works in the third year is you start rotations. The first three-month rotation was not bad because I was in psychiatry 
nine to five, you know, in and out, and I can do whatever I want. But then once you start doing medicine, you know, um, medicine is like you work in a hospital setting, but you're on call every third day. So every third day, you're there overnight, basically. And it's it's 90% of the time you're there, it's a waste of time, okay? You're just sitting around doing nothing. You're just, And you're half asleep, and you... You know, everyone's drinking coffee, and, and you, know, you, you know, all I wanted to do was leave and go to the gym, you know, that kind of thing. And I just felt like I was wasting my time. So it, it got to the point where I would legitimately, after rounds in the morning, at 6 in the morning, I would sneak out and go into my car that was in the parking lot, and I'd listen to Howard Stern and eat, eat a meal, and I would fall asleep and, and disappear, literally be gone for two hours and then come back and catch up on the next... And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm like, you know, I'm not even learning. I... I I can't do, I'm not, I had no interest, and I said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was very, very, I was very, um, I guess you could say, uh, unaware of what the right decision was to do. And so I went and I talked to one of the, the, the counselors at the medical school. She's like, why don't you take, a, why don't you take the rest of the year off and, and, and get your thoughts together and come back next year, if that's what you want to do. And it was like someone gave me a, a get out of jail free card. It was like, I could do this. It was. It felt so right. I remember driving home from the hospital that day, and I'm like, I'm going home. I don't have to go back to the hospital tomorrow. This is the greatest feeling of all time. And I had to tell my father, of course, which is you know, although my father was never judgmental. I mean, I said, Dad, I, I took it. I'm taking the year off. I'm taking the rest of the year off. I said, I don't know. I, I just, I just, I hate it. I said, I hate it. And yeah, I'm sure he knows what all the money I spent and all the time I put in. He was probably saying to himself in the back of his head, Oh, what this? What's wrong with this kid? But my father trusted me to make my own decisions. He didn't want me to. He didn't want to ever tell me what to do. But I knew it felt right. And I think when you when something feels right, it's right. I mean, I know people that have quit jobs. They were making half a million dollars a year, and they, to, to, you, yeah, to train people at a gym because they were happier doing that. And so when you know inside when it's not the right. So I I knew that I had gotten all the education and information that I needed from from what I did, and now. I had to figure out what I wanted to do, but I wasn't even thinking about it. I was so consumed with bodybuilding, I, I, I got to put all my efforts into this because I love doing this. And so I started training people at the gym. I, was, I got a job at Bally's. I was training people like six people a day, which was, I was paying my bills and I was bouncing on the weekends. And I was never lazy or anything like that. So I, I was doing what I needed to pay my bills and I was bodybuilding basically. And, and you know, when you do something you're passionate about, doors of opportunity open up for you. And, Probably the doors opened up wider for me because I had the medical school background and the ability to write and to talk about you know complex subjects and so I had I had something on my resume that the other bodybuilders didn't have you know. Yep. Well, now we'll move on to the present. Yeah. Uh, I think about this one a lot recently. So I'll, I'll give you a quick thirty second story, then I got the question for yeah. you. I feel like I don't go to the gym very much now. I go usually even for the last five years when I did go. Most of the time I go at 5 a.m. or something. I've always been a guy that goes early. Yeah. So if and when I go, there's no one in there, and I go to smaller gyms or anytime places, it's kind of my go-to. But every once in a while, recently when I moved, I go to the, some of these gyms in the area, and I notice that when I go in, if and when I go in, pretty much at any time, 8 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon, a Sunday, it doesn't make a difference. The amount of muscle maturity, the amount of the physiques on average, the baseline, are more impressive than I ever ever used to see even 10 years ago, never mind 20 years ago. So, and that's, and I'm not one that just gets impressed by physiques, but I see muscle maturity in, in females backs on 19 year olds that you didn't see in 35 year olds, you know, 10 years ago, as a, as someone who's a coach, as someone that gets before and after pictures of people, if someone that's looked at thousands of people's physiques over 20 years, are you noticing that people's baselines are stronger than they used to be from what you do? Have you noticed any of this? Um, I don't necessarily know if they're better or worse. I think there's more knowledge out there now about nutrition. There's more knowledge about training out there because of social media and the internet. So I think a lot of people are, are, are more educated about that. I also think that, you know, depending on what gym you go to, I mean, if you go to a gym where people train, that's the gym that kind of where everyone goes, you know, that trains. And so, and I think we forget sometimes also what, you know, the youth of America looks like. We get so brainwashed by yourself. I mean, think about it. For how many years did you go into the gym and you were the best physique in the gym? For years yeah. and years. Well, especially while yeah. you were competing. So everyone else paled in front. Now you're, now you're smaller. You don't kind of train as much. 
So now you're more impressed with the people that you probably never would have been impressed with. <laughs> That's the way I feel. I'm like, oh, that guy looks really good. I'm like, meanwhile, I'm looking at pictures of myself. I'm like, these people probably thought I was retarded in the gym when I would train because I was 320 pounds and I was, you know, squatting 650 pounds. So people probably thought this guy's the, the craziest looking guy I've ever seen. But I didn't see myself like that, you know. Now looking back on it, I'm thinking if I saw someone in the gym who looked like me, I probably would be sitting watching right now too, even though I've already looked like that. <laughs> so I think the physiques are comparable. I, I think maybe like a little better just because of information. I think you're right. I never thought about that. Like that's valid because I still don't see anybody ever. No offense to people ever. <laughs> like, oh no, you're better than I was. No, not at all. Yeah. I used to just see Jason or Ben Pakulski. Yeah. That was my baseline. So yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> or another present uh, related question for you. Um, and you don't have to get into this one too much. I'm just curious, but I was surprised because sometimes when we do these interviews, I want to bring up certain topics or I almost do, but I'm always afraid, you know, the, the YouTube or the system's going to bitch slap you for doing it. But lately I feel like I'm like, Dave, I could just tell by the thumbnails, you've been talking about stuff that's a little bit more hot button related yeah. as an outsider for me with like the vaccines and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So is that ever a challenge for you with the channel in the present? Is it harder now than it was two years ago? Like, what is it like as someone with you with your channel? Is that something you have to think about even as a bodybuilding information fitness channel? Is that a challenge for you at this point? I pretty much, I pretty much talk about whatever I want. You know, um, I haven't really discussed the vaccines because I don't really have enough information. I don't think anyone has enough information on it. And I've been to everyone who asked, because I have a lot of people who ask me on a regular basis, are you going to get vaccinated? Are you vaccinated? I'm not vaccinated yet. I'm still, my wife is, um, I'm playing the watch and wait. I really don't see enough data. I, you know, my, my take on it is, and, and I don't know if this is really true or not. This is, this is my gut feeling on the whole vaccine. I think the vaccines are causing a lot of these mutant strains to come about because I think people are vaccinated and I think they work against the regular strains of the virus. I think the virus is mutating now because so many people are vaccinated and that's why we're seeing more cases now of it. Um, Obviously, if you are vaccinated, it seems as though you do have some more immunity towards even these other strains. However, there are people who are vaccinated who are getting COVID still. So th that tells me that the vaccine is not perfect. I think what happens is I don't even think the vaccine actually stops you from getting, you know, most vaccines, you get vaccinated, you can't get the, you can't get the disease. You're immune to it, right? I mean, that's like with polio or, vaccine or, or, or um, you know, smallpox or whatever these other vaccines are out there. Um, I think that with this vaccine, and I could be wrong, this is just my gut feeling, I think that you do get infected with this thing, and I think that you just don't get any any side effects from it. In other words, your your immune system clears it up quickly, but you do get infected, and that's why people that have the vaccine can actually pass on the virus to other people, because I think they actually have an, they're actually getting actively infected with it. You're just not seeing it because their immune system is clearing it up faster than other people. So I don't know if that really makes it a... a a vi you know, a viable vaccine or not, you know, um, I, I also don't really love the way it works, you know, in, in the sense that it causes spike protein, you know, expression in our bodies, as opposed to giving a dead end virus and just letting our bodies respond to that virus. So I'm not sold on the, on, on the vaccine yet. However, it is scary still. I do see people like I, when I see someone like Bill Phillips go down, gets COVID twice. And the second time he's on a, in the hospital on a ventilator for 60 days or something or 30, 47 days or something like that, whatever it is, that, that, that does scare me because he was in good shape as far as I know. Uh, but, you know, I try not to put myself in, in any kind of situation where other than, you know, going out to eat or going to the supermarket. Um, I Look, I, I love, go, I want to go to the Olympia and the Arnold. I'm not going. I still haven't gone because I don't want to put myself in that situation where I'm around huge amounts of people for a couple of days straight. I, I don't even go to the, I was going to go to the reptile show in Daytona. It's a big reptile show. I didn't even go this past weekend because I don't want to put myself in that environment. And then potentially infect my 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 um, my family, so that that's where I stand with the vaccine. As far as t t talking about it, I don't really you know I, I'll talk about it if people have questions for me. Um, I'm trying to stay apolitical in this whole war this whole sense because this this you know th look I'm, I don't consider myself a conspiracy theory guy, but I also don't necessarily believe everything that's being told to us. So I'm not going to go out there and rant and rave about conspiracies because I don't know what the truth is. If I had not, when I talk about science or if I talk about diuretics, I'm talking about knowledge that I actually have and that I will sit and debate anyone on because I know how this stuff works. You know, if I don't know how something works, then for me to argue and, and to rant and rave about it, is, I'd be a moron because I could be wrong, you know. 
I don't like to be wrong. You know, I've been wrong plenty of times in the past, but and I'm not afraid to admit that. But I don't like to be wrong on a, on a regular basis, so I try not to to try to you know argue about things I don't know that much about. I'm gonna. Um, I heard this in, uh, the other day, and I think it applies right here. I heard when you mentioned with Amanda doing the wait and watch game. Yeah. They, I actually agree with that. I heard a great analogy of why that's a great idea. Whereas and I never knew this because I'm not a pilot. That when a pilot and a co-pilot pilot fly, they're not allowed to eat the same meal in case one of them gets a stomach right. bug. The other person can still fly the plane. Right, right, right. And it's like, and if you have a family and we're going to use a, you know, something and try it out and see how it goes. Let's not give it to both people yeah. in case we need to make an adjustment. Exactly. So, you know. No, that's exactly what the, the, the our uh, strategy is, and, and, or her strategy was, I guess. You know? yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, <laughs> before we move on to the, the future, you know, Dave, I've never even brought this up. I mean, you, you've alluded to it in other videos. I'm not one to really ever talk about myself or talk about anything that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not into the, I'm the opposite of PT Barnum. I am not big into self-promotion. Yeah. But what I want to do for a moment is, is um, I've never even shared this with you. I've been doing my own podcast, just a podcast. I don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm coming up on my 50th episode now. I've been doing oh, wow. it for a year and a half. I've never even plugged it. The only reason why I'm, I'm mentioning to people is I wanted to wait a year. I, I'm sure you appreciate it with what you do. Like sometimes I wanted things on the record to prove that I knew what I was talking about versus, <laughs> hey, hey, look what I'm talking yeah. about. And then I didn't want to be that guy that looks like he's full of shit. So for those that have never even know that the, my podcast exists, it's called the Pasquale Podcast. And people might say, well, what do you cover? I don't cover anything that RX Muscle does 97% of the time. Right. Not, It's not a bodybuilding show. It's not really even fitness related. It's everything that I'm into. Um, and I'm just going to list out some of the stuff that I've covered for people in the last year yeah. and how much it's helped them. Some of it, you're going to be like, Tony, why the hell didn't you tell me? I helped over 300 people in the state of Florida get grants for $50,000 for their business. You don't have to pay back. Wow. Um, I did that. Cup, I helped anyone in the state counties of Florida, any person that wanted $3,000 on top of your stimulus checks, I taught you how to do that. There's over 10 different stocks that I talked about on there. And I only mentioned ever, maybe 15 ever. Mm -hmm. All 10 of them at least went up four to 500%. Wow. So I've covered that. Um, I talked a little bit on there. I combined your baby making protocol with what my dad's natural testosterone protocol is. He's like, 71 years old and has 1100 right. um, natural test level, which is impressive. Wow. And I kind of combined those worlds. And in one of the episodes I talked about it and my balls expanded so much that I had uh, blood in my semen. So <laughs> those show how much it, it scared the shit out of me. I don't know if you, have you ever had clients tell you that, that they're, they had blood in their semen? The only time I've heard that is from people who've had like prostatitis or something like that, like a prostate infection. But Yeah, it scared the shit out of me yeah. to have pink semen. So yeah, yeah, that would be a little so, scary. So the point is if people have never listened to it, uh, where do they check get it? Out it? Sometime. Yeah, yeah. Check it out, Pasquale Podcast. Let's move on to no, the, no. But where do they, where can people download this thing? Oh, anywhere. Uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of that stuff. So I got a pretty strong listener base. Do you at this have point. Do you I, have uh, guests, or you just talk every time yourself? Actually, that's a good question. I don't bring on guests conventionally. It's usually just me. But I brought on people before that specialize in um, resume writing and teaching you how the algorithm works nowadays and how to use. SEO to optimize your resume in a modern Ooh. world. So it's all about just, I, this is the way I look at it. Everyone listens to podcasts right. and none of those podcasts actually do anything to make your life better today because right. everyone's trying to sell you something. I don't sell anything. I don't even talk about Vava on there really, right. I, unless it's applicable to the topic. Right. It's just about, I don't do it for money. It's a passion project I do. Sometimes I'll do an episode every two weeks. Sometimes I don't do one for six. Sometimes right. I'll do four in a week because there's a lot that I feel like sharing. So right. it just kind of ebbs and flows, but um, people listen and they keep coming back. So I just wanted to share it for once for those That's that great. like. Yeah, I'm going to start listening. Uh, yeah, I wanted I to covered. mention one thing though because I, you know, a lot of people have asked me, and I know you, we were talking about this off camera, about you know what I've been doing for COVID, you know, in terms of preventing myself from getting it or you know keeping my immune system healthy. And, you know, I, I obviously, you know, I'm big on, you know, vitamins and minerals. And obviously, we know zinc is really important, chelated zinc. Obviously, I use V-mineralized, which I make from Species Nutrition. Um, I do, you know, also take a, a higher dose of vitamin C. I've been taking like two to 3,000 milligrams per day. I know there's some people out there to take. I think, I don't, were you the one who told me you take 10,000 or something like that? Who told No, it wasn't no, me. No, someone else. But I, I don't believe in mega dosing vitamin C because you get diarrhea from that. So I take about two to 3,000 milligrams per day of that. I also take your Vava Life um, products. I do the, um, uh, actually, I've been using the, uh, the lower grade one because I, I ran out of the other one. The Mo I Connection. use Monad, um, and I also use the 
Pull up the website for a second. I want to show people that. What's the what's the lower grade one that we were giving out? The connection the connections just for the brain. That's yeah. just brain health. Okay. That's just memory. I take connection because I can't remember, and I, obviously it's not working that well because I couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> I take it every day, and then the, and then the, what is the wisdom? The one that's like above it, right above it. Yeah, the wisdom. People ask this question a lot, um, especially the RX community, because they do. People do order. For those of you that watch these and stuff, please leave comments because. I do ship everything same day. I do the money back guarantees. I've still never had a return in two years, uh, which I'm really proud of. And what's our really coupon code order. for, for RX Muscle listeners? RX15 RX 15 RX 15. is the coupon 15%. code. So yeah, basically it's, it's really easy. The wisdom is basically for the entire body. You have five different adaptogenic herbs that they give to the astronauts, they give to the Vikings, they gave to the samurai. It allows your body to adapt to whatever's going on, whatever you're ingesting or being around. And then you have lion's mane for your brain. That's wisdom, right? And then connection for people that maybe, hey, I can't afford an all-in-one body product, or I don't need that. I make connection just for the brain. That's most important. That organ's gotcha. controlling everything else in the body. So my dad takes the connection. He's 71. He was born with the APOE4 gene. Both my parents actually take it technically. So mm -hmm. that's for the brain. And then you have Monad, which is the cold sores. I'm disgusted by how many people from this community love to write me and tell me, Tony, I had a toe, toe fungus. It got rid of it. Tony, I had a, a cold sore on my tongue. It got rid of it. Yeah. So yeah. cold sores, cancer prevention by educating your tur um, your um, turkey tail to educate your T cells. Those are the three products. Okay. So I take the, I take the monad and the connection now, but I need more wisdom. So you're going to send me more wisdom because I'd rather have the yeah. higher grade one than the, than the lower grade one. Um, yeah, for those by the way, anyone know, who, bought, was buy, who buys products on our, um, excuse me, on DavePaloma.com was getting a free bottle of Connection just to try it. I know a lot of people were very thankful and were, were thanking me that you had provided that for us. And uh, I've been throwing, my, my wife was throwing it in all the orders. So people really liked it and enjoyed it. So hopefully, uh, but if, yeah, if you want to go to the uh, website, VavaLife.com, you can put the uh, RX15 and get you 15% off on that. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. But anyway, so that's my, so I do the, the two mushroom products. I do vitamin C. And I do my V mineralized for the zinc and magnesium. And then, you know, if I ever feel like I'm getting cold, uh, like a cold or anything like that, or I feel like maybe I'm, my, my, I'm run down a little bit, I'll start taking, I don't know why, I'll start drinking diatonic water or taking quinine pills to make sure the zinc is really getting pushed into my cells, which we know will inhibit the, um, the, the replication of the COVID virus. I also take injectable glutathione from uh, titanmedicalcenter.com. So I kind of have this whole regimen that I do on a regular basis and, I, and you know what very I got sick yesterday my kids brought home something from the, some stomach virus I literally had it for like one day and that was it it was gone meanwhile my kids had it for like two or three days so I definitely noticed my immune system is heightened on all these products and so I want to thank you for the, those great products well you're welcome because we trade fiberlize and protolize we for do it. we do yeah, we <laughs> yeah just, it's worth it. I love to trade you know I, I breed you know I breed snakes and everything like that and some of these snakes, you know, some snakes go for ten grand. I mean, there, you can have a twenty dollars snake, you can have a ten thousand dollars snake. It depends on what genes are in them and how they combine, and if anyone's ever produced it, if it's a world's first. So I love to trade because I don't really, need, I don't do the snake breeding for money like some of these other guys do. I, I mean, I make money from it, but I don't, I don't care about the money. I would rather trade a high end snake for another high end snake, so I don't have to pay for one myself. And so I'm all for trades all the time, you know. That's good. <laughs> I, I'd be on. great back in the old times, you know, when they used to barter and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> be good. I, know, I was about to say some stuff. I'm like, wait, it's, it's going to come up. I was about to have a family guy male moment and do something very ethnically insulting to somebody. So I'm just going to skip yeah, over it. Right. It's Italian <laughs> ethnically insulting. Yeah. All right, we can do yeah. that. Go with a, a future one for you. And this one I'm generally curious about. I know you have, right. you got the family. I'm not sure if you guys are going to have more kids. But no. let's pretend we fast forward. You're done. It's five years. You definitely yeah. know you're not having more. I know your testosterone levels, from what you've told me in the past, hover somewhere in the high fours, maybe high fours, maybe around 490 or 500. Yeah. My question for you is, do you think you'd ever contemplate doing a little bit of TRT that you hover closer to 800? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, why? Um, but first, I want to just mention that it seems as though, uh, from what I've noticed, that your testosterone level has no correlation necessarily with your fertility. Because I know a lot of guys that are low testosterone that have really good fertility. Um, because, you know, as long as it's endogenously being produced, your body will have good fertility usually. Um, if I was low and I felt 
tired or if, if I felt like I was losing muscle or if I felt like I was getting like soft and I didn't like the body composition I had, I probably would supplement with, with, with uh, testosterone. I don't, I'm not against, I'm, I'm completely in favor of, of hormone replacement. Um, I do have an enlarged aorta. I don't know, it hasn't changed in size since I've been monitoring it for the last couple of years. I do have a, a heart arrhythmia um, that I don't notice and that I haven't had any episodes at all, um, but I have obviously, I, I get it monitored on a regular basis because I have the little, the, I have the defibrillator in there. Um, so I'm always nervous that if I take testosterone that I might hypertrophy my heart more and it could make the situation worse. It doesn't appear, as a matter of fact, since I've been, the last couple of years, my heart has gotten smaller in size. So I don't even, I don't even have, I only have mild left ventricular hypertrophy, which just tells me that probably the size of my heart was athletically induced. Um, it had nothing to do with any of my situations. I probably had an arrhythmia my whole life, from what, at least from what the doctors seemed to think. Uh, it wasn't related to the size of my heart. Some people have arrhythmias because their heart gets too big and then the signal can't you know, pass through the membrane possibly because it's, it's too thick, the wall. That's not the case with me, obviously. So I'm not against it. Um, if I was low and I didn't feel good, I would certainly supplement, even with like 100 milligrams per week. Um, and like I said, I'm not trying to have any kids, so it, it's, if anything, it would be good because I, would, I would buy, might take away my fertility. <laughs> we're always worried we're going to get another, we're going to have another one. So I'm not against it intrinsically, but I feel good, so that's why I don't do it. I, I always tell people, how do you feel? Well, you feel good, then don't change anything. Don't do anything. Don't do anything different. If you don't feel good, that's when you have to make changes. It's the same thing with contest dieting. If the diet's working every single week and the person's losing a certain amount of weight and they're improving, why would I make changes to your diet? Why would I make changes to your workout if you're, make, if you're increasing in strength all the time and you're, and, you, and you're making improvements to your physique? I always say don't mess with things unless they need to be messed with. And that's a big mistake people make in bodybuilding. They think they always have to be changing things you only change things when, when you're not getting results, you know, or the results you want. Then you might have to make modifications. So I feel good. So right now, I'm, I'm not against, not ruling out that I'll never use it. Maybe if I hit 60 years old, I might have, my testosterone might be 200 and I feel terrible and I'll take it. But um, I just don't need it right now. Yeah, the reason I asked the question is just because I noticed, at least it feels like with my own body, I feel the same either way. But due to my own injuries, you know, my spine compressing and I yeah. got a bum knee and all that. Um, if I use 220 milligrams of testosterone, I don't think it's in my head. I think it's legitimate. I probably weigh 10 more pounds than if I use 180 or 170 milligrams <laughs> of testosterone. Is that is that plausible? I mean, is that, that there, sound? Yeah. Is that crazy? No, there's there's a there's a um, there's a, a line drawn in the sand someplace, and if every person is different, it's what they consider the physiological effects of testosterone versus the pharmacological effects of testosterone, meaning that. At some dose, okay, it's usually over 200 milligrams per week, but for everyone it's different. Because I was on 200 milligrams per week and I was at 1500 my testosterone, my total testosterone. Yeah. I don't know why it was so high, I just, obviously that's my body. But at every person it's different. If Once the level goes over a certain amount, it becomes a pharmacological effect, meaning that you're getting a drug-induced effect. You're getting a steroidal, like a ster steroid cycle effect from the drugs. You're building more muscle at an accelerated rate beyond what you would get from a physiological dose. So if you have no testosterone production in your body and you give someone a replacement dose, at some point the replacement dose, if it gets too high, becomes a pharmacological dose and they start building muscle like they were on a steroid, like they were taking steroids. If you keep it below that, they kind of are normal, basically. They stay the same, they're not building muscle at an accelerator rate, they just feel good and they feel like they, they're, they're like they did when they were maybe 18, you know, that kind of thing. So I think your your level might be 180, might be your 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 or 200 might be the line of the sand. As soon as you go over that line of the sand, you're getting a, a, a bumped up effect from it. You know. Understood. Final question for the day. Totally random. Yeah. I don't hear you talk about music much. I'm not even a huge the way you, the way you're not like a huge marijuana alcohol guy. Yeah. I'm just not a huge music guy. I'm not yeah. like doing it all day. I rather <laughs> think or read. Yeah. What's the last concert Dave Palumbo went to? Oh, uh, I. I... I, you know, I, I'm like you. I'm not a big music guy either. Like, I li I appreciate music, and I and, and I'm emotionally moved by music, but I'm not like obsessed with like, oh, this band, that band. Although it's funny because now that I'm older, I like the old bands because I think it just makes me remind of reminds me of my high school and college days in the '80s and '90s. Uh, you know, the la I did go to um, I went to a Madonna concert with uh, my ex in I don't remember. It was probably in the early 2000s in Madison Square Garden, 
And Madonna, I, the reason I remember it is because Madonna, the, she, she has this crazy thing that she doesn't like air conditioning because she thinks it ruins her voice. So it was swelt, it was like sweltering in this place. It was so fucking hot. And I, and I, you know, I was pretty big at the time and I was, I couldn't, I almost couldn't make it through the whole concert. That's how hot it was. And I, and that, that was the last concert I went to. Um, well, thank goodness you said you went with your ex because otherwise there'd be uh, meme pictures of Dave Palumbo with a fanny pack on and a Madonna shirt. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, I bought her, I, I had a client who used to get tickets to, to, to um, concerts and if someone at the last minute didn't use them, he would be like, you want these tickets? And I'm like, you know, I knew she liked him. So I, I, we went to Madonna. We went to Prince, too, I think, and, and uh, NASA Coliseum as well. Um, luckily, there was air conditioning in that concert. But so I'm not, like I said, I like the music. I, and I like Madonna. I liked her music back in the day, so I don't have a problem. But I, you know what I find myself listening to now? I'm in the car. I have Sirius, you know, uh, satellite radio because it came with my, my BMW. And when I take the kids to school in the morning, I, <laughs> I don't know why. I, do. I play heavy metal, hair band stuff and stuff like that. On, the series has all these crazy you know, heavy metal stations. And, I, you know, I, I let my kids listen to it. They, they find the music. My son likes Iron Man by, you know, Ozzy. <laughs> and I don't know why all of a sudden I'm listening to it. I never listened to it really this music before, but uh, I'm listening to it lately. Like, I don't know why. So basically they're fired up when they get out of the car. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm waking them up in the morning a little bit. Yeah. I'd be like, welcome to the fucking jungle. That's, that's right. Know. That's right. That's right. That's, <laughs> Let, that's it, Dave. That's all I got for this week. Um, you got any closing thoughts for everybody or what? No, you know, it's, uh, I, I like doing these shows because it kind of it takes the pressure off me of having to ask questions. And you know, I like to you know, get, and you, you help me elicit information that I don't even think of. Uh, I haven't thought of in years. So that, that, that's why I keep doing these. And people seem to be responding favorably to the shows. They really like them. I, I get people saying, do more of those shows, do more of those shows. So uh, I want to thank you for that. And I just want to remind people also, vavalife.com, RX15 will get you 15% off. If you're losing your memory or if you have a bad immune system, especially in COVID times, Check out the products. They're great. Anthony, thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Until next time, everybody. Peace.